Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. We are back and this is what we have on offer for you tonight. Michael O'Neill turns down the chance to become the next Scotland manager. Kenny McLean signs for Norwich but will stay with Aberdeen until the summer. Celtic keen to add quality in the transfer window. Yeah, we're back here on STV2. Lots to talk about on tonight's programme. And it's all in the company of Alan Ruff. And I'm delighted to say on a Monday, back with us, Gordon Smith. Um, it's been a long winter break. I'm sure uh, one of us on the panel is certainly happy with the winter break, Gordon. <laughs> and I wonder which yeah. one it can be. Well, I think it's only right when the teams took the winter break that we should take one as well. <laughs> See if anybody can guess which one of us has been hauled here. Absolutely. Be a hard, hard guess. Uh, I can't argue with you on that one. One of us has got, got it 100% <laughs> correct. Anyway, great to have you back with us here on STV2. Lots to talk about. First port of call, the Scotland job. Uh, Michael O'Neill has decided to turn it down. Give me your immediate reaction uh, to the decision to stay with Northern Ireland and to snub Scotland. Uh, I think it's a major story, this, because it's taken so long that he's a, a, the, the strong candidate, and yet... You know, he's, he's gone through the whole process. He's allowed the Scottish people to speak to the Northern Ireland to, to, get a, to obviously sort out a compensation deal. He must have known in advance because I've been reading the papers about the, the deal he's getting. The contract was less time than Northern Ireland were offering. The money was also less. He comes and speaks to the, the SFA. Why would he do that? Why is he going through all this process in order to turn us down? Has he been using it as a way of, of, of building himself up, getting a lot of credibility? people talking about the fact that somebody else wants him in a job. I thought if he's going to go this far, he's going to see the SFA, he's going to take the job. What was it in terms of the deal, or what was it in terms of what he's been speaking with Stuart Reagan about, has made him turn around now and say, I don't want this job. Yeah, well, on that basis, uh, I think you've got to look, first of all, at the statement that was released from uh, Michael O'Neill. Everybody was wondering uh, whether today he was actually going to accept uh, the job. This is what he had to say. Having given the matter a great deal of thought and consideration, I have decided not to take up the opportunity to become the next Scotland national team manager. It is a huge honour to be offered the position. However, I do not feel that this is the right opportunity for me at this moment in my career. I would like to place on record my gratitude to the SFA for the very professional manner in which they conducted negotiations. And I would also like to wish them every success for the future. It is a blow, Ruffy, and the immediate thing for me is, where do we go now? Yeah, uh, as usual, when you're negotiating with somebody else, some of the other candidates move on. Paul Lambert, for example, I thought would have been a, a really good candidate. As far as I'm concerned, Alec McLeish is still there. He's not going to cost the, the 500000 that uh, we would be paying to Northern Ireland. So he's still there, tried and trusted. Uh, we all know what he can do, but it'll be interesting to see what other candidates uh, get thrown up. But I, I think, I just, see, I just wonder why it went this far. He surely could have turned down the job beforehand. Did he want to build up this big bit of publicity for him in terms of saying he'd been off the job to turn around and say, it's not the job for me at this time? Has it only been not the job for him this time since he spoke with Stuart Reagan uh, earlier in the week, or last week it was? So I don't understand that. But I think that in terms of candidates, I think uh, Ruffy's right. Paul Lambert was maybe a, a candidate for it. Alec McLeish, I still think, should be. And the other one I would throw in, maybe even now at this stage, Peter, would be Steve Clark who has come back to Kilmarnock. He's got a very, very good CV. He's been at a high level and he's turned Kilmarnock around. Now, Kilmarnock Football Club, people won't be happy with me suggesting that, but he's got to come into the fray. Uh, I mean, strangely enough, you're talking about um, a couple of Scots, which I, I think is, is fair play. Uh, would they go down the foreign route? Because when you pick up tomorrow's papers, Ruffy, it will have five or six foreign managers that maybe nobody's considering. You know, it's a... It's a goose head ink, it's a, a Lars Lagerbeck, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, a manager <clears> that maybe uh, is out of a job that's experienced that we haven't actually thought about. So, I, I, I mean, I just wonder if we are limiting ourselves now, and as you mentioned, Alex McLeish, suddenly, mm -hmm. it, it would look, if Alex got the job, it would look as if we were thinking, well, we didn't consider you, first of all, this is us trying, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to save ourselves. Well, that's something Alex would have to get his head around. No, he's been out of the game for a while now. Uh, as I said earlier, we all know what he can do for Scotland uh, and uh, the players would accept him. If it were going down the foreign route, I would like to think that it would be somebody who has the credentials to take us to a final. 
you know, a, a, somebody who's been at maybe a smaller country and taking them to, you know, a big final. Because that's what that's the remit. The remit is whoever it is, we get to a final. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the package itself that would be on offer with the huge bonus to get Scotland to a major finals um, is certainly an incentive for some. Um, now, here's what Stuart Regan had to say on this. And this, I think, I, I don't think there's any doubt he's going to get a fair bit of flack because I'm now waiting to see what plan B is on this one because we've waited such a long time on it. Um, the board of the Scottish FA appointed a subcommittee to oversee the, the recruitment process, compile a list of suitable candidates and ultimately made a recommendation as part of that process and in recognition of his work in taking Northern Ireland to Euro 2016, Michael O'Neill was identified as an obvious candidate for consideration. Uh, to that end, of course, they requested permission um, and now he's decided against it. We wish him well in the future in his endeavours. Um, and now uh, we continue our recruitment process uh, from the candidate list established by the selection committee. So they're going to go through this li list uh, with a view to giving the new national coach ample time to prepare the squad for the UEFA Nations League. And of course, there are four friendlies coming up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is there is a subcommittee that gets chosen. That was one of the things that I found quite strange because as chief executive and with my contacts in football, when it happened, when I was there with SFA, I thought I should be in a position to make the, the selection and choose the next manager of the, of the country when I was the chief executive. But I wasn't allowed to do it because I felt that, you know, I was allowed to make recommendations. I did a lot of work in terms of putting the candidates together. And, and I brought people together and at that, at that time what they said was we would just want a Scottish manager because Bertie Volks, it wasn't long after Bertie Volks, they didn't want to go down the foreign route. But to be fair, we're saying go down the foreign route, but to a degree Michael O'Neill falls into that category because he's not Scottish. He's got a big Scottish connection, he plays football here, he lives here and he knows the game here and all that. So I think that, that suits very well because he knows the players, he knows what's happening. Any other, go, you go to the other foreign people and regardless of, of their abilities, it's still a risk. You don't know whether they're going to be the right man for the job. But as I say, as, if I'd been doing this job before I, I met Michael O'Neill, I would have always been saying, before we even got down the stage of saying, we want you in for a meeting or whatever, I would have been make, making it very clear to him, are you taking this job or not? I want to know now. I don't want you turning this down at a later stage once you've had this meeting. You know what I mean? But, but he's done it now. And it's, a, it's an embarrassment to a degree. Yeah, I, I mean, I, listen, we, we, without <coughs> us, and we, we're now living in a, a society where quite simply after any decision, after any situation that, that has arisen, you know, outcomes the, the scatter gun, uh, uh, you know, or the hammer, uh, you know, to take out the person we think is uh, at fault here. There was a process. Everybody established after Gordon Strachan was sacked that that process, Ruffy, would uh, allow us a fair bit of time before we got to the friendlies. You know, which now happens to be March yeah. against uh, one of your old haunts, Peru, hmm. um, uh, and Costa Rica on the horizon as well. Um, but the, the, the problem here is we're now into January, you know, and everybody's known hmm. for quite a considerable amount of time that it was Michael O'Neill as the number one choice. Do you think the chief executive is worthy hmm. of quite a bit of flack that's going to come his way? Uh, I think, unfortunately, it will come his way. You know, I think one of the early statements when Gordon left was uh, we've got until next September to get somebody. That's not the case. You know, we've got friendlies in between. You know, we'll have to have somebody in place. We have to have somebody in there who, who's going to, the players are going to know the style of play that he's going to play. You know, and uh, unfortunately, I think because we've left it so late, I think uh, the days to come, there will be flat going about there. But... Uh, the, the way to stop this flack is to identify a really good candidate and let's work on it and get somebody in. It's a second choice candidate. Yes, isn't it? It whoever, is. whoever gets the uh -huh. job now is like you're not the first, and they'll have to ex try and explain that to people. You know, we're coming for you because we went for somebody else first. I mean, a, a name it's not maybe even mentioned. We've not said yet. Malky Mackay might even come back into the fray. Because yeah, I, I he, can't he, see it. Go, I can't see going under. I know they did. They from. did rule him out. They did rule yeah. him out before, but <laughs> he might be saying to them, look. Uh, I'm, I'm the person, I want this job, I would like to have this job as, as well. And you never know, they might say, well, he could, he could do both roles and stay in the job, but you never know whether he, he comes into, the, into the, the, the discussions. I, I, I can't see him coming into it. And, and while I'm a, a huge um, you know, admirer of Malky and he's got a good CV and I like him as a person, I, I'm going to be blunt with you here, Ruffy. Mm. 
they're already getting flat because they never got their first choice. If they mm-hmm. suddenly then put Malky into the frame again, it opens a pack of wolves who will be there to absolutely annihilate him on mm-hmm. his past misdemeanours. And I think yeah. that's a double whammy. So I, I, that, that's why I think it rules him out. Sadly, mm-hmm. but that's the world mm-hmm. we live in because he's, he has to take the criticism for what he got involved, uh, you know, with his texts and with the, uh, you know, the statements mm-hmm. that uh, that were released about him. Yeah, again, that's the unfortunate thing about it. I think a lot of us, a lot of people, would say, "Let's move on. Let's give somebody a second chance." But I mean, Stuart Egan's already come out and said, "No, mm-hmm. he's got one game, you know, and that is it. Let's let's dismiss him right away." So if he was to change tack on that, you know, that wouldn't look particularly good either. So I don't think Malky will get the shout. Yeah, okay, uh, you can give us your view on that at Peter and Ruffy on Twitter, facebook.com forward slash uh, Peter and Ruffy as well. It's good to be back uh, coming up in the next part of the programme. Uh, we're going to look back over the weekend's results in the Scottish Cup. We'll look at the Scottish Cup fifth round draw. It's still got a number of teams uh, that are involved in actually playing uh, their previous round games. So it's a little bit muddy. But we'll discuss that with Gordon and Ruffy after this quick break. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's football show here on STV2. Back after uh, quite a considerable winter break and there's no point in kidding on. Ruffy, we are in plush new surroundings as well as per uh, the terms of Gordon Smith's contract. He had to be in a bigger studio. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, they're absolutely amazing and obviously anybody comes in who gets the chance to come in can see some special rooms that you've uh, dedicated. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's going to be uh, an interesting second half of the season for us. Hopefully you're going to join us, spread the word and of course there's big news on the way uh, for Friday nights as well. That's all to come. Uh, we'll reveal a very special guest star we've got for our opening programme on the Friday night as well. So that's to look forward to. But it's all about the football. It's all about you uh, getting out to games and giving us your opinion as well. Uh, we'll react to news on a daily basis and uh, we'll also look at the back pages and the sports headlines. Here's a look at what was on offer this morning just to get the lads' thoughts. And uh, that is a crock of crap. Not exactly the best headline to read out, uh, but nevertheless, it's uh, reference to uh, Neil Lennon slightly miffed with Craig Levine's comments after their win in the Edinburgh Derby uh, and of course uh, Morellas will snub admirers this is uh, a suggestion that there could be people sniffing around Alfredo Morelos and uh, the mail and as you can see there uh, Musa unnerved by transfer saga claims uh, Brendan Rogers and the Press and Journal and there we have McLean heads for Norwich but stays at dawn. Confirmation of that deal that was struck and confirmed uh, earlier this afternoon. And uh, finally, there we have it, the uh, final newspaper, uh, The Courier, uh, with second chance for Rusty Dark Blues. This is, of course, a reference to the replay against Inverness Cali Thistle. And there were some cracking matches over the weekend. I uh, will look back on... Uh, some of the games get the thoughts of Ruffy and Gordon Smith. Here's a look at the draw for the fifth round. I mentioned to you there's quite a few teams still in there because they were unable to play some of their ties. Uh, for Martin or Cove Rangers against Livingston or Falkirk. Morton against Peterhead or Dumbarton. Hearts will take on the winner of Albion Rovers, St Johnston. It's Kilmarnock, Broda Rangers. Air United have the reward of a home tie against Fraser Borough or Rangers. It's Dundee and Inverness, Cali Thistle against Motherwell and Celtic against Partick Thistle. And uh, those matches uh, played on the 10th and 11th of February. So uh, there's the uh, draw. And I'm just looking here at uh, some of the fantastic matches uh, over the weekend. Uh, one of them in particular, some people suggested there might have been uh, the possibility of a replay up at Pataudry, but I don't think there was any chance of it uh, when Ryan Christie and uh, Gary mackay Stephen are on top for him. No, it was an impressive victory because, I mean, St Myrna are in great form, as we know, and it shows a kind of golf uh, to a certain degree <coughs> where a, a performance like that between the two divisions. You're always thinking that, you know, the, 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 the championship is as strong as the, as the premiership. But on uh, on Saturday, I think Aberdeen just blew St Myrna away, didn't they? Won comfortably. And Gary, McKay-Stevens, what a goal he scored. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, at least, at least he's got a good sense of humour, Gary McKay. Stephen mm-hmm. Ruffey, he posted a great tweet with him in reference to him obviously diving into the river. There'll be none of that after, a, mm-hmm. uh, although we would have cut him some slack had he done that because it was a fabulous goal. Um, no such worries for the holders of the Scottish Cup, Ruffey. Celtic hammered breaking, as you would have expected. Yeah, yeah I think early on in the game, you know, the Celtic were attacking <laughs> uh, Scott Sinclair in particular. You know, was getting all the width in the world and we, we saw what he's good at, you know, taking on players. I think the first goal particularly just set the tone, you know, by a couple of players, cut it back. Forrest just sidestepped it into, into the net and, and after that I think Breakin got a wee bit of a shock, you know, losing a goal so early and after that it was one way street and uh, no, I think they'll be happy with the result to come back after the, the break that they've had and uh, a very comfortable win. Yeah, uh, and in the Lanarkshire Derby, Gordon, I think you know, both sides would be desperate to get into the next round. I think Stephen Robinson probably needed that result a little bit more than Martin Canning. I agree with you. I think that because of the form that Motherwell have been in, um, they've been quite heavily criticised because they did a good run in the, in the League Cup. So this was a, an opportunity for them to have a run in, the, in this Cup too. So, you know, they've got they're through in the, the possibility they're going to be playing Dundee in the, in the next round, which will, will be a good game as well. So they, they really did need a result. Hamilton were a little bit disappointed. They gave away the goals, I felt, a wee bit cheaply. But uh, having said that, Motherwell, was just, as you said, Peter, will just be delighted to have got a result. Yeah, and before I talk about the Edinburgh derby, which had a wee bit of controversy and a, a sting in the tail, uh, Partick Thistle maybe probably would have yeah. wanted another tie. They got through yeah. against Queen of the South, but suddenly Celtic on the horizon, Ruffy. Yeah, it's always good to get a good cup run. I'm sure Partick Thistle would have preferred a, an easier tie. Uh, to maybe advance uh, in the competition. But no, they'll go to Parkhead and uh, they've been there before. They know what they're up against, but they certainly have went there and made it difficult for Celtic before. Yeah, OK, everybody's entitled to an opinion. And Gordon, um, some pundits don't like the possibility of VAR in um, Scotland, goal line technology. I personally would like to see it because I think, you know, if we want to take our game seriously, if we want to move on with, I think, the rest of the world because discussions are already taking place to bring it in right across the globe. Yes. I think we should have it done about you. I absolutely agree with you. I've been pushing this for years saying that when the games are getting televised and uh, you know a big audience, uh, there's nothing I, I felt highlighted it more than a, an incident when you get where when Ireland get knocked out of the World Cup and Terry Young rehandled the ball, played it across goal, the goal's given and everybody's sitting at home, millions of people watching at home are saying that goal should be disallowed, that's not correct. So. Yeah. The referees have got to be helped, and that's all it's doing. It's helping them, and I'm totally in favour of it. Yeah, and of course, Ruffy, uh, with that in mind, the assistant was able to help the referee at the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I bet you Ollie Shaw wishes he was there in the previous game uh, mm-hmm. at Tyne Castle, where Hibbs feel more than rightly miffed because I mm-hmm. thought Ollie Shaw's was just as far over the yeah. line as Don Cowie's. Yeah, I think that was a golden part for it, for as far as uh, Hibbs are concerned. That, uh, that's still in the back of your mind. It's not that long ago that it happened and then all of a sudden it happens again. But it was clearly over the line. There's nothing. Uh, you can't even debate that. I would just like to know who had the blower to blow it back in because it was certainly going back out. Or out and back in. It's yeah. absolutely But amazing. the thing about it is the difference, the difference in that scenario was in general play, the, the, the assistant referee is in line with the last legs of the players. So if the ball hits the bar, he's not up close mm-hmm. enough to see it or in line whereas that was a corner kick yeah so he's right on the on the t- mm-hmm. touchline and corner flag so he can see it better there absolutely of course uh, after the match you always get uh, the manager's comments everybody i think was licking the lips at the prospect of neil lennon on this one but first of all uh, craig levine started the ball rolling with getting through to the next round so it's a massive one for us you know? massive i mean the the longer the, the run goes on, the more difficult it becomes and the more uh, steely uh, hips become and they're protecting something. Um, so we needed to break it and break it as quickly as possible. Um, and, and that, a lot of that today was relief uh, because you know, I don't like this idea that you know, hips are gaining any sort of momentum and I want to try and you know, restore the natural order of things. Yeah, uh, restore natural order. Um, that suggests that Hearts should always be in top in Edinburgh, according to Craig Levine. Hibbs boss Neil Lennon was having none of it. Restoring natural order. I don't understand that. What, what is natural order? 
but hearts beating heads every time because it's just a crock of crap I think it's pretty poor pretty poor statement to make I think it's disrespectful to my club and my players and me and we got two more games to come so we'll see if natural order is restored then well that started the ball rolling Ruffy um, natural order yeah. Hearts yeah. should be in top according to Craig Levine Neil Lennon said we'll see in the next couple of games yeah, it's fired up a wee bit, you know, that's what happens in, in derby games, you know, that um, when you win the game, you feel as if you could maybe get away with saying something like that, when, when you're not on the, the winning side, you're obviously upset about it, but it certainly will fire it up for the next one, I don't think these games need to be fired up any more than they are. He'll, but, he'll uh, have endeared himself to all the Hearts yeah, fans, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. Craig was it a little arrogant? It was, it was a wrong thing to say, you don't say things like that, you're just happy with the result, you take it that you've got the first win in quite some time, so you don't have to say that, I can yeah. understand. But he's obviously wound uh, Neil Lennon up a little bit, but he's done a great job, Craig Levine, I have to say that, since he took over yeah. at Hearts' as mind. I mean, even he, he's tightened them up defensively. Last seven games, I mean, the last ten games, that, that they haven't lost for ten games, but they've had six draws in that time. But defensively, the seven, seven shutouts in a row is tremendous. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, of course, they are improving, according to the goal scorer, Don Cowie. I think I just think we're a different team now. You know, I think we're stronger. Um, when you're signing players like Naismith and, and Berra, I think that gives you, you know, real options and real solidarity. Um, and I think we can only get better as the season goes on. Um, the younger players are getting more and more game time, and they're getting better. Um, I thought Harry was brilliant, especially second half. Um, getting on the ball it was difficult first half but you, you know you see a player that's it's really you know growing in confidence and getting better and better so it's uh, it's exciting yep and ever improving at heart side but what about Hibs they are out of the cup they were looking to extend their unbeaten run against their great rivals in the capital and uh, Paul Hanlon clearly uh, highlighted what went wrong the fight and things like that was there which you'd expect in a derby but I think when we when we had times to get the ball down and play and, and things like that, we, we never done it. We rushed things and panicked a bit in possession, which in these games it's, it's probably the easy thing to do. The hard bits to, to compose yourself and, and try and pick a pass. And I think too many times a day we, we panicked and, and maybe took the easy option by maybe putting it down the line or just kind of just helping it on and taking a bit, uh, a bit of composure on the ball. OK, it uh, wasn't the best of games, no. Ruffy. Who do you think still got the upper hand in Edinburgh? Uh, I don't think there's much between the two sides. I think if you look at the first half, uh, I think Hibs had the advantage, Hearts had the advantage in the second half. I think the first goal was always going to be important. I think the Boyle miss was a big one. OK, uh, we now know who is going to face who in the Scottish Cup fifth round. We're going to turn our attention after the break uh, towards the SPFL and, of course, uh, the Premiership football returns. We'll look ahead to... Patrick Dissel against Celtic and hear from Chris Davis next. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's football show here on STV2 Monday. And it's Gordon Smith, our book room guest. Delighted to have Gordon with us and uh, delighted to have Gordon just basically for the company of someone who hasn't been in holiday because next to him is uh, oh, Mr Tan Man himself. <laughs> Looking utterly refreshed is Alan Ruff. Delighted, uh, Ruffy. Uh, that you are back with us. I, I want to get your thoughts, guys, on uh, transfers in this window so far and who you think's actually mm -hmm. uh, done a fair bit of good business. Um, but uh, we'll talk about that coming up a little later in the programme. The next part is obviously the return of um, Premiership football and it's Partick Thistle first up, Ruffy, mm -hmm. against Celtic. Yeah, I mean, obviously, both teams just come back from the break. Uh, both of them have had wins at the weekend. Uh, I'm sure Alan Archibald will want to go into the game and pop a, a good performance. Uh, they have done before. Uh, I think in the last game, there was a big penalty decision that Patrick Thistle never got that uh, they thought they should. But Patrick Thistle will have to be on their toes because we know what Celtic, the damage that Celtic can do away from home, you know, with the players that they've got at the disposal. Everybody will be wondering who the striker's going to be, obviously, with the, the debate about Dumbelli. So, no, I think it'll be a really exciting game. Full house. And uh, I'm sure uh, anybody that goes along won't be disappointed. Yeah, and we're now going into a period, Gordon, where quite simply everybody's looking at the clubs and seeing what transfer business they're doing. Um, Partick Thistle, I think, is going to be crucial for them this uh, month because at the bottom end, they've got to try and pick up points around the teams 
that are there with them. Relegation, possibly a playoff. Celtic have been a little slower in the market than most. Yeah, I'm surprised at Celtic. I don't know whether they're just waiting. You know, there's not as big a need for them in terms of the, the Scottish game for Celtic to strengthen because they have a, a few players uh, more than other teams have got squad players. But I think they will still maybe make a signing w with a view towards next season for Europe or anything like that. But I think there's it's, there's not a lot of money in Scottish football. I mean, there's hardly any. Most of the players that are coming in are loan deals from elsewhere are free transfers. There's hardly any buying players. You know, Celtic did buy a boy for St Mirren, obviously Mullen. But if, apart from that, I think that um, there's there's a little bit of time to go. Obviously, you've got you know 12 days ahead in terms of getting players in. But I, I just don't see an awful lot of movement in the market. It's a, it's a strange thing. You mentioned Lewis Morgan. I watched St Mirren a couple of weeks ago, Ruffy. I thought he was. Uh, I thought he was excellent off either foot, looks uh, a, a real prospect, but then uh, it begs the question for Celtic, is he better than a Ryan mm -hmm. Christie? Is he better than a Liam Henderson who's just gone mm -hmm. to play in Italy? I mean, it's a, it's a, a you know, a Jack Hendry will come in. Is mm -hmm. he better than a Christopher mm -hmm. Ayer? Uh, do they replace, you know, the players who quite simply maybe have been exposed in the last mm -hmm. six months for Celtic? Is he... You know, the better if they get Jack Henry, does he have to wait a couple of years mm -hmm. and sit in the sidelines to try and, yeah. you know, replace the more experienced players? Yeah, that does seem to be uh, looking to the future at Celtic. You've got Anya there as well. You know, is, An is Henry going to jump in front of Anya, who's a, a promising young player? But he, and you look at some of the young players that come in, look at Johnny Hayes, although he's injured just now, but look at him when he came. You know, he was the main man at Aberdeen. He comes to Celtic and can't get in the team. You know, and that, that's the, the predicament that players have got when they get the, the, chance, the chance to join teams like Celtic. You know, they have to say, do I bide my time or am I going to be a first team player? But I think it, there's a lot of players being bought for the future there. It's a good point Peter's making about Lisa Morgan coming in. Because you're looking at it and thinking, you know, you've seen how well Christie is doing at Aberdeen in the Premier Division. You know, you're saying, you know, Morgan come in, is he going to be a challenge to Christie or Christie? Is he in favour or not? But maybe it's a case of, from Celtic's point of view, they're just thinking these people are, are all potential. And for them, 300000 I think, they paid for young Morgan. I think it's not a lot of money for Celtic. No, absolutely not. And he's, he's got uh, a chance to impress uh, at uh, New St Mirren Park until the end of the season before he moves into uh, Celtic colours. As far as the game was concerned, well, uh, Chris Davis, Celtic's assistant, was speaking today ahead of Partick Thistle against Celtic. Uh, first of all, he had uh, a little pop at uh, the SFA because he's not happy with some of these international friendlies and the demands on some of the Celtic players. Yeah, you do need a break. You do need a break. They need a break. They can't. You cannot play 12 months non-stop and expect at a big club um, the level of intensity you want to be in the Champions League. It's impossible for players to play for 12 months. We look after them if they have been, have done that. We always manage it, and that's something that we've put a lot of focus on: is making sure that at some point during the year they get their rest, because they do need it. Because it, you just can't be asked to do that. Yeah, well, that's uh, Chris Davis on it. We're going to hear from Scott Brown in the next mm -hmm. couple of seconds, Ruffy, on this uh, situation as well. So, with that in mind. Uh, does the likes of Scott Brown and others pick and choose the friendlies because Celtic mm -hmm. are going to have the demands of this huge match against Zenit in the Europa League? Yeah, but this has been happening down through the years, Peter. You know, it's not just happening to Celtic, it's happened to a lot of clubs. If you look at the English clubs, I'm sure all their players are away as well. You know, the top clubs are playing Champions League football. But so the, the clubs themselves have to monitor each player individually and they'll they'll decide, you know, who's struggling a wee bit, who needs a rest. More or less, they should be rotating their, their, their team, you know, and if they see somebody taking them out, they've got enough players, young players who can come in and take their place. So it is a difficult one. I can see where he's coming from, but it's nothing new to me. This. The problem is you get more games in Europe nowadays, mm. so that is the only problem. In, in days gone by, you know, you, were, you played like two, two, two rounds to get to the quarter-final. Yeah. Nowadays, you've actually got three qualifying rounds before you're even into the, the group section. So there's a lot more games and the European games stack up. And that's why I can see their point there. You know, that they don't like friendlies because, but Scotland, he needs to realise that Scotland are putting friendlies together because it's, it's somebody else will be taking over and he has to like try his players out. So Scotland on this occasion do need to have these friendlies. Yeah, here's uh, the Celtic captain Scott Brown's take on this. I think 
the holiday time is a huge one. You know, I was sitting through next door and we are talking about that. And, uh, and Last year we got six days, came back in, went straight into the Champions League qualifiers. This Probably a week and a half we'll get this year, so it's getting uh, <laughs> not so good in the holiday. But uh, as you, you get the opportunity to play for Scotland, be a new manager in here, obviously want to see everybody. So uh, and there's a couple of friendlies coming in March, then at June as well. So it'll be good for him, but uh, maybe not so good for all the Celtic lads. Yeah, there'll be eight qualifiers next season, uh, Ruffy. I mean, that is a huge mm -hmm. demand on uh, not only Celtic, but you know when you think of the fixtures now. I think Brendan Rodgers mentioned, and so many other managers have highlighted that there's a very short close season now. Mm -hmm. Footballers now in their life in their lifespan of playing. If you're playing at the top end. The demands mm -hmm. of being able to, yeah. to even fit in a break are, are tight. Well, I think that's why most clubs now have their players monitored day day on day. That's why they've got all the facilities, the technical facilities, you know, the all the expertise, you know, the individual people who are going to monitor people and see what their levels are at. You know, so I think it's just that's the way it is now. You know, I'm not going to say that players don't want to play for their country as much as what they used to because I'm sure there must have been players going back playing Wednesday, Saturday, then an international game and I don't ever remember many players saying, no, I'm not going to come and play for my country, you know, but things have moved on. I appreciate that. Maybe there is more games getting played now, but I think it's just all about rotating the system at club and country. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the one thing we're looking at, uh, and I mentioned to you guys, is about transfer business. Of course, uh, Celtic uh, still with a few new faces to come in, uh, according to the assistant, Chris Davis. I'll echo what the manager said, really, in terms of it being quality, not quantity, that we're after. And I think the squad has demonstrated over the last 18 months that it's a strong squad. Um, winning four trophies, two seasons of Champions League, eight points clear at the top. So to improve upon that, it's a certain level of player that we need. We're working on it. Um, understand the fans are eager to hear some news and um, because ultimately they just want the very best for their club and Celtic and that's what how we feel. OK, it's a certain level of player that Celtic are looking at to recruit Gordon, which backs up the point you were making there. Um, with that in mind, it has to be a player that can do something against Zenit, surely. Yeah, I, I think that looking straight through the Celtic squad, I've been saying it for a while, I think they would probably agree with it as well. Centre-back is the weakness in Celtic's team. And I think that is where they need to strengthen and uh, get players in. They've got obviously a young boy Ayers coming through, he looks decent. But I still think the centre-back is the area that... Uh, that Celtic could and should strengthen in? Yeah, I think we're all waiting. And uh, Simonovic seems to be a player who wants out. I think he wants to get down to England. It'll be interesting to see if he's one of the players, that, uh, as Brendan Rodgers says, is on this revolving door. We've obviously seen, seen Henderson moving on. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, if that is the case, they'd obviously have to have somebody, uh, Ian Mark, to come in. But I'm sure uh, Celtic supporters, like every time of this year, They've always been treated to a, a, a good signing. Uh, I'm sure Celtic won't let them down. Yeah, what about your old team, uh, Patrick Russell? <coughs> um, they've managed to get um, uh, Bailey Cargill on loan from Bourne, the 22-year-old, uh, until the end of the season. Uh, I would imagine he needs a wee bit more as well. Yeah, but the good thing about it is uh, Salmon started scoring goals, you know, which is en encouraging. I think they've tightened up at the back. But uh, I think uh, teams like Partick Thistle, any player they can bring in uh, is a freshness about the dressing room. And that's always a good thing at this time of the year. Yeah, well, I, I don't think uh, too many people will be betting on Partick Thistle uh, to get the win. You never know, Fair Hill. Um, stranger things have happened, but for that to happen, uh, Alan Archibald, the Jags boss, says they're going to have to be at their very best. It was a close game the last time out of Fur Hill. I think they are a different animal away from home. Sometimes they can be really cutthroat and really go for it. Um, so we need to make sure we're at our best. And it's the same old adage we play against Celtic. You need to make sure they're going to work for their chances, they're going to get them. And you need to make sure you take yours and you get, if you get the chances. We know that if we have all our players playing at their very best, um, it gives us a real good chance to get something. We've seen Hearts doing it. Um, Rangers went and gave them a real good game just before the break there as well. But you need to tick all the boxes and make sure you're, you're at your best to get something from the Champions. Yep, that's Alan Archibald, Partick Thistle against Celtic on the Tuesday. Of course, uh, this week we'll continue looking at uh, the other fixtures. On the Wednesday, there's the small matter of Rangers against Aberdeen. There could be quite a tasty reception for Derek McInnes from the Rangers fans after his decision 
not to go to Ibrox as the new manager. We'll look ahead to the four fixtures on the Wednesday as well. And we'll discuss Kenny McLean and his deal to Norwich. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. Uh, Alan Ruff and Gordon Smith are with me here in the studio. We are on uh, five nights a week. Hopefully you can join us every night. If you can't get out to a football, pro, uh, football game, I beg your pardon, then why not join us on a Saturday as well on STV2, two o'clock until six. We'll keep you up to date over a four-hour period on uh, every game across all four divisions in Scotland. If the ball hits the back of the net, Gordon Smith, uh, Ruffy, and of course Hugh McDonald of the Daily Mail with uh, no shortage of opinion as well. Uh, that's STV2 at two o'clock on Saturday. But as far as tonight is concerned, we've been talking about some of the clubs that have done a fair bit of business. Um, I suppose uh, all eyes will be on Aberdeen and what they're going to do. And the reason I mention them is because Kenny McLean has confirmed that he's joining uh, Norwich City. But this deal's a little strange. Aberdeen have got a bit of money and they keep him until the summer. Yeah, that seems a, a little bit of a strange deal that they would uh, buy a player at this stage. Uh, when his contracts, maybe they just wanted to make sure that they, Aberdeen were saying we're not going to sell him just now, but they're making sure that they get him. So they've decided to do the deal, pay him now. But as I say, Aberdeen, they're losing one or two players. They managed to get them again back, but they've lost, as, as Ruffy mentioned earlier on, Hayes, and now losing McLean. Really, players who have been exceptional for Aberdeen and done a good job, but at least they can keep him till the end of the season because there's no doubt about it, Derek McInnes will want to be fighting to get that second spot. He, will, he knows they're competing with Rangers for it. If Rangers would beat them on Wednesday night, Rangers go above them in goal difference. So there's nothing in it in that part of the league. So in terms of the two games, Aberdeen were pretty embarrassing in the two performances uh, previously against Rangers. So it'll be interesting to see whether that, that whole scenario that was affecting Derek McInnes at that time, the fact he was maybe leaving, had an effect on the players. It'll be interesting to see how they play on Wednesday night. Uh, and no matter how uh, social media or newspapers or indeed television programmes um, uh, roll, uh, there's always that great little bit of gossip that fans love to hear. And there's a suggestion that uh, Aberdeen could be looking to the likes of Dylan McGeoch at Hibernian and Chris Cadden at Motherwell. Um, now, if they could pull off uh, those two players mm -hmm. and uh, parade them in a, an Aberdeen strip, then I think it really would be game on because I think Rangers have actually, to the surprise of more than a few people, have brought in a few players that will really put them mm -hmm. in the mix for this battle for second, Ruffy. Yeah, I think uh, from now to the end of the season, obviously the players that were brought up in loan uh, are an improvement. It'll be interesting to see how many they can hold on to, you know, at the end of the season. But I think that's one of the reasons that Dennett McInnes, you know, stayed at Aberdeen. He obviously, with the owner of the club, he's obviously wanted a progression at the club. He's wanted to see more players coming in. And if you're right in what you're saying, Cadden would certainly be a fantastic addition. And I think that's the kind of player that Denny McInnes would be looking for to improve an Aberdeen side. Yeah, and that, that would suggest money's available if they were seriously trying to get these uh, players. I mean... If it was me and I was Neil Lennon, I'd just firmly shut the door on Dylan McGeoch because when yeah. he's fit, he is the, the player of real talent that can go past players. I mean, McGinn's yeah. a different style of player, but I love watching McGeoch because he can pick uh, a pass, Gordon. I, I agree with you, Peter. I think McGinn's actually better when McGeoch's alongside him. I think that uh, he doesn't have the, the, that responsibility. He has more responsibility when McGeoch's not there. So I think they're a good combination. And you're right, Hibbs should be able to turn around and say, no, we don't need to move him on. We're keeping them, but Aberdeen, they're obviously getting some money in for Kenny McLean, but I think there's also a scenario is they do have more money, they're going to have more money in the future for some transfers to bring, and that's maybe why Derek McInnes decided, because he was promised, I think, resources to, to improve Aberdeen and get Aberdeen up, up there again. He brought in back, Neil McGinn's back in there. So I think that Aberdeen will be wanting to be in more, in more of a challenge, not just to be second spot, but want to be in a more challenge for the top spot too. Yeah, I was slightly surprised um, that um, Aberdeen were able to coax him again back. Great bit of business. Uh -huh. but, um, they've got him on a, well, for a player's point of view, Ruff, he's got a good deal out of it. Yeah, well, I think it's the relationship between him and the manager. I think that'd be a big saying why he went there. There were certainly enough clubs interested in him, Harps, Hibs. Uh, so I think he'd be a big player. And uh, the bonus at this precise moment in time is, Gary Mackay Stephen is playing out his skin, yeah. you know. So that's the the plus that they've got now got a better player on the part with him coming there. Yeah, just I've got to ask you this, Gordon, just from a point of view of 
Uh, we all like a bit of banter, as long as it doesn't become abusive. Um, does Derek McInnes get pelters on Wednesday night? Uh, I think he will get a bit of that, yeah. I think that there'll be a degree of it there just because he turned them down. But he had a, he did a job for Rangers. He was a player, he did a job. And, you know, they, they might be quite even quite happy uh, that Graham Murty is, is doing pretty well in the job because Derek McInnes didn't take it. So he might get a bit of pelters, but I would imagine you would... When you, even when you go back to your old club, it doesn't yeah. matter. The fans still want to have a go at you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, roll on Wednesday. It's got the makings of a <laughs> cracking game, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I, and I think it would be remiss of me not to talk about those loan deals that we're talking about uh, with regards to Rangers. Jamie Murphy, uh, despite the debacle that dragged the whole thing to, uh, I think, an embarrassing level where he's, he should have been on the plane to Florida, then all of a sudden it stopped. Yeah. Regardless of that, they got it over the line. He's in until the end of the season, possibly longer. Um, what do you make of their, their, their deal so far? I, I think he was a good player before, but I was down at Brighton at the weekend there and there wasn't any great issue of the fact that he's leaving. The, the, most of the people were just saying he wasn't involved now anyway. He wasn't challenging for a place in the team. There was no problem the club that he left, but he is a decent player. So I think I think that uh, that's been a good sign. And Martin to play centre half, also a good sign. That kind of level of experience, a lot of people put it in the same category as this, uh, David Weir signing when it happened. They've got young players for centre back, but you want an experienced guy in there. So I think overall, and Halliday's back in at the club. I think O'Halloran's back there now yeah. too. So and that the only one I would have said that I was quite surprised didn't move for was Naismith. I and having seen him playing for Hearts. Uh, yesterday that I thought he was very, very good and, I, and we'll look at that now and think that is a player who could have actually could have played a role for Rangers and I'm quite surprised he never decided to move from him. Yeah, absolutely. I think the key issue here for Rangers, Ruffy, in this transfer window could also be, as well as the players that they're bringing in, whether it's loans or whatever, they're still going to strengthen that side, is the players that they can try and get out. I mean, the suggestion that Morelos is quite happy to sit in um, Alves, they'll be keen to get him off the books. There's even mm -hmm. talk about David Bates could be on. I, I think they'll be looking at people that think I'm not going to make a, a contribution and by hook mm -hmm. or by crook, get somebody to bite to buy them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that'll be the big problem. I think we're, we're all led to believe that some of them are on particularly good wages, Herrera as well. You know, but uh, obviously, Graham Murphy will have to maybe work a wee bit of magic uh, as far as the players coming in. Halloran's the one for me. I, I'm just wondering if we'll now see the real Michael O'Halloran. I don't think he was given an, enough encouragement with the last manager, so I think they might get something out of him. Yeah, I, I think they'll get something out of him, Gordon, if they play him in a more uh, forward role. Yeah, I think I, so. I wouldn't play him wide right. I mean, no. listen, Graham Murphy's absolutely <laughs> clued up. He knows what he wants to do with his team. He's yeah. just got to make sure that they, they perform and there's not you know, every now and then a glitch. Yeah, you're, you're right, Peter. And what they need is competition for places. So if a, a Halloran comes in there and challenges, you might get more out of the guy even who's in the team because he knows that a Halloran could come in the team. So that, that's what you need, competition. And Rangers haven't had that enough this season. You know, you almost could nearly all the time pick what the team should be. Mm. Alves would certainly, I think, will move on now. If he's not getting a game, he wants to play in the World Cup then I think he'll want to get out, definitely. And, and he's on a big wage, my understanding is. You know. Yeah, uh, you know, getting him out, I think, is going to be the biggest thing. Uh, full marks to them if they get that deal over the line and get him out as well. Um, now, the other point I was going to make to you guys is there are more than a few transfers down south worthy of our comment. One quick one I've got to mention is uh, Robbie Nielsen lost his job. Alan Stubbs has been linked with MK Dons. Didn't quite work out for Robbie Nielsen. Yeah. Uh, down there in the end. I was sorry for him because I thought he, he had a great future ahead of him and, and he left Hearts and everybody think, why is he going down there? But he was going down there to make, although it was a lower division team, League One in England, to make his career and build his career in that position. And he started pretty well. I mean, last season, they were at one stage, it looked as if they were going to be quite close to getting in the playoff places. Didn't quite happen. I don't know whether it was to do with transfers in and out, but... I'm sorry to see him lose his job and I hope he gets back into football because he's a nice guy, Robbie Nielsen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here, here. Um, OK, Ruffy, give me your thoughts on the longest running transfer saga of all time. It was Alexis Sanchez to Manchester City. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Suddenly, <laughs> it just dragged on and on. I don't know yeah. about you, but I was, there's a great Scottish word. I was completely and utterly scunnered by it eventually. <laughs> um, but suddenly, it looks as if uh, Mkhitaryan, Sanchez, work permits, Mm -hmm. And Mkhitaryan could be at Arsenal, Sanchez wearing the red of Manchester United. 
Yeah, and I think Manchester United uh, supporters will be intrigued by that. I think he's a, a super wee player. I think he gives you a wee bit extra, you know, on the park, something special. You know, he's prepared to do something different. And uh, I think Manchester United are, are the winners out of this one. I think, uh, I think we've got the pain and we'll be expecting something yeah, exactly, special. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to do it every week. But yeah. uh, he'll have a healthy bank balance. That's yeah, absolutely. Think. And of course, there's, there's even talk now, and I wouldn't rule it out because the money is colossal, but there's even talk about Ronaldo coming back in the summer to Manchester United. I, I, I think Ronaldo looks as if he's trying to manoeuvre a move out of Real Madrid. The things he's been saying, he has fallen out a lot of times. Him, he, he's got a relationship, not the best relationship with the supporters as well. He, he reacts to when he scores a goal. Sometimes he makes gestures towards him. So I, I think his days at Real Madrid are, are probably over. And I think, you know, who else would go from but Jose Mourinho and get him back into Manchester United? Yeah, when you think about it, the two Manchester clubs and the spending power, mm. you wonder if anybody's able is going to be able to bridge the gap to get the title. Chelsea, best hope. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's what the rest of the, the English teams will be saying. You know, they can't they can't match them at all, and I think the two of them will just get further and further away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, um, well, we're delighted to be back. Join us if you can, half past seven uh, on STV2 every night. And, of course, we've got a special big programme starting on STV on Friday nights at eight o'clock. I do hope you can join us for that. You'll still be able to tune in to STV2 as well. Uh, just before we go, I mentioned to uh, young uh, Matt Craig, who uh, sadly lost his life, uh, passed away, uh, Hamilton Aki's youth coach. He was a young player there. Uh, uh, all our thoughts with his family and Jack Aitchison as well, who sadly lost his father. And let's not forget uh, Blackpool and England World Cup legend Jimmy Armfield, who sadly passed away at 82. Uh, our thoughts with all those families. From Ruffy, from Gordon Smith and myself, thank you for watching Peter and Ruffy's Football Show. It's great to be back. <laughs>